So when people are dealing with especially hard disk hardware, one of the things that they noticed is that hard disks were kind of slow and they're mechanical devices so they're not entirely reliable. They fail and they fail at some pretty consistent rate. If you have a, a couple racks of servers, those servers each have several disks in them, then a disk failure is something that you're gonna be dealing with every year or two. If you have a bunch of um, racks of data, if you have a big data center, then you start to get into disk failures being something that happens every week, disk failures being something that happens every day. You just have a like subscription order on your vendor and they send you more disks every month because you're gonna have to replace five or six of them. And that's fine, it's something that you can deal with, but you need some way to deal with it. And so the way that people came up with to deal with these two problems, performance and reliability, is this idea of having a redundant array of inexpensive disks or a RAID. And you'll frequently hear people say RAID array, that's definitely redundant. So then we have a redundant description of a redundant array in any case. Um, so RAID. And the idea is that if we just add more disks, we can solve both our problems. So more disks, less problems. Usually that's not how that works but with, with RAID, it can be. So there's a bunch of different RAID levels, and the different RAID levels give us different trade-offs on trying to solve the two problems, performance and reliability, and also the third problem, which is minimizing our use of, uh, minimizing the number of disks we have to buy and the amount of power we have to use running disks and the number of servers we're gonna have to have to fit all our disks and that sort of thing. So we wanna, uh, try to avoid using too many disks. So the most basic two RAID levels are RAID 0 and RAID 1. RAID 0 is called RAID 0. I don't know why it's called RAID 0, but the thing to remember, the, the thing to keep in your head is that RAID 0 is called RAID 0 because it isn't RAID. The reason it isn't RAID is because it isn't redundant. This is striping. Uh, with an R. And so the idea is we're going to take two or more disks. We have disk zero. Well, we have a disk. We have another disk. We're going to RAID zero of them together. And what we're going to do is we're going to treat them as one disk. That's how all of these RAID setups work, is you take multiple disks, disks and pretend that they're one. But what we're going to do is we're going to store our data striped across the two disks. So what we get is apparently one disk that is twice as big as we would have without the array. So if we need to store four pieces of data that are each half a disk big, we'd end up with blocks looking something like zero, one, two, three. And if we want to think about this logically, we can think of this as being a logical OR operation. So each block of data that we're storing is on disk, the disk on the left or the disk on the right. Now, this doubles the amount of space we had, but that's not that exciting unless for some reason we're storing files that are individually bigger than a disk. That sometimes comes up, but not all that frequently. Mainly the reason people do this is for performance. So, Because of the way striping works, if we're writing enough data to the disks, or if we're reading enough data from the disks, having two disks is gonna make us go twice as fast. And the reason for that is because we can read from both disks in parallel. If, for example, we wanna read block zero and block one, we can read zero, block zero from the left disk, and at the same time, read block one from the right disk. The two uh, reads are independent, we can run them in parallel, they won't interfere with each other, we'll read the data into buffers in memory. The, uh, the like RAID driver or the file system driver or the RAID controller, which can be hardware, is gonna do this for us automatically. And the result is that instead of having our hard disk drives go 150 megabytes per second, off a RAID one, or sorry, a RAID zero array of two disks, 
we frequently, at least for reads that are significantly larger than one block of data, are gonna be able to get 300 megabytes per second. If we go to four disks, which stripe across four disks, reads that are significantly more than four blocks are going to go four times as fast, so it's gonna be 600 megabytes per second. And hard disks are slow, but if we get more of them, we can solve the problem by just adding more disks and therefore adding more parallelism. The disadvantage to RAID 1 is that we didn't get any redundancy, and that means we got extra failure. So instead of having, imagine we have a 1% chance per disk of having that disk fail over a certain set of time, maybe in a year, um, with one disk, we would have a 1% chance, and with a two disk RAID 0 array, now we have whatever the chance is of two independent 1% chances, it's probably around 2% of our array failing. Because it doesn't, we don't need both disks to fail for this to fail. If either disk fails, we've lost half our data, and this is striped, so we lose like the even number of blocks if this disk fails, and we're probably not recovering from that. If we wanted to spend like manual time going through and trying to reconstruct data block by block, maybe we get something back. But no software is going to deal with us giving it data that's the just the odd number of blocks of a file. The software isn't going to be interested in that, and it's not going to give us anything. So that's RAID 0, and that's useful in many cases. RAID 1 is the other sort of base idea, and RAID 1 is called mirroring. So just like with RAID 0, we're going to have two disks as the base case. And just like with RAID 0, we could do this across more than two disks if we wanted to. But instead of saying that we're going to write for, for any block, we're going to write it to one disk or the other disk. In this case, we're going to say that for any block, we're going to write it to one disk and also the other disk. So we have the same amount of disk space as we had for a single disk. So we went from having uh, one disk and having it be maybe a, a one gigabyte disk to having two disks and still having one gigabyte of space. But now we have two copies of everything. So we don't, the, the obvious goal here isn't performance, the goal here is redundancy. Since we have two copies of everything, this means that either disk can fail and we don't lose any data. We can uh, this disk can fail, we can pull it out, we can put in a, another blank disk, we can have our RAID driver, our RAID controller copy the data from the, from the good copy, and we've lost nothing. So one disk can fail without us actually losing any of our data. And it turns out that this actually isn't nothing for performance. On writes, There's no performance benefit, but on reads, two disks means twice the speed. Because just like with striping, we can read block zero from one disk, and we can read block one from the other disk in parallel. We have to have the the RAID controller or the driver be clever enough to like schedule which um, which block gets read from which disk. It's a pretty straightforward scheduling problem, and we should be able to go twice as fast because we have twice as much hardware to actually do the reads off of. So those are the two most basic RAID levels, but those aren't. I mean, these get used pretty commonly too. They're they're simple, easy to understand, and do the thing that you want from them, but People also like to do more complicated setups, especially when they have more than two disks. So the, re the next RAID level that I want to talk about is called RAID 10. And it's not called RAID 10 because it's the 10th RAID level. It's called RAID 10 because... It's RAID 1 plus RAID 0. We're going to do both of them. So that means we need four disks we're gonna have a disk down here, which is going to have a friend 
and we're going to raid one of them together. Then we're going to have a disc down here and another disc, which is going to be its friend. And we're going to raid that together, uh, raid one that together. So this is raid one, raid one, and then we're going to raid zero. Our two raid ones together, and that's going to be what our raid controller or raid driver is going to expose to our operating system as one disk. And so this has some interesting uh, performance properties. It does basically exactly what you'd expect. So if we have the same data that we wrote to our RAID 1 before, it's going to come out as 0 mirrored 0, 1 mirrored 1, 2 mirrored 2, 3 mirrored 3. So those are the, the four blocks that we're storing on our, on our RAID array. What this means is that any one disk can fail without us losing anything. Any, any one of these four disks can fail. We can swap out the failed disk, put in a new one, and copy it back from the mirror. So we can survive one disk failure. We also get a factor of two performance speed up on writes from our RAID 1. So this goes faster than just a, uh, a normal RAID 1 would have, or sorry, from a RAID 0. This goes faster because we have mirroring. And if we want to do reads, and our RAID controller is clever enough, we'll get to stack the performance benefits of RAID 1 and RAID 0 on reads. So we have four disks, and we can do our reads from all four disks. So we'll do read block 0 from this disk, 2 from this disk, 1 from this disk, 3 from that disk, all in parallel, and go four times as fast as we would have with one disk. This is a nice system. It's relatively simple, and so it sees a lot of use, even though it's not as efficient as some of the other RAID levels that uh, get used on more modern setups, or more complicated setups, are more popular to talk about on the internet. All right, so the next, more, the next one is one that people almost never use, and that is RAID 4. So the idea of RAID 4 is that we're gonna have some disks with data on them, I'm going to do three in this case. So the data that we have on here is zero, one, two, three, four, five. And here we have three disks. We've done striping across them. So we have a performance benefit conceptually, and we have a, uh, and we have no redundancy benefit. If we lose a disk, we're done. What we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to lose a disk, but we don't want to do mirroring. And so rather than doing mirroring and doubling the number of disks that we need to be able to lose one, we're going to do something tricky. And that is we're going to XOR together. You know, I'm going to add together, because that works the same. I'm going to add together modulo 10, these numbers. So 0 plus 2 is 2, plus 4 is 6. And so what we're going to store on this disk is our uh, so we have three data disks and one parity disk and so for each stripe we're gonna have a stripe of data across the disks and the parity disk is going to store for that block it's going to store parity data again we're gonna do addition modulo 10 here for the second one so 1 plus 3 is 4 plus five is nine, I guess it doesn't matter that we're modulo 10. But now, here's the trick, we're gonna lose a disk. So disk two here goes bad, we lose all the data, we put in a new disk, and now we have to try to rebuild. And we can rebuild by looking at the other disks in the parity disk. So our parity is six, we subtract four and zero, because if we're using addition as parity, we can use subtraction to reverse the parity. Normally you use XOR, which is a little bit more obvious, but six minus four minus zero is two. Nine minus five minus one is three. And we've recovered our data, even though we lost a disk and didn't have any copies of it. We had the parity disk and we had the other disks in our, uh, in our RAID. So RAID four is great for redundancy. No matter how many data disks we have, we just have to add one parity disk in order to be able to, um, to recover data in the case of a one disk failure. But we've lost our performance benefit on writes. In fact, we have this thing over here 
performance bottlenecks us down to the point where writes, all writes have to hit the parity disk, and therefore our write speed can be no greater than the, the time it takes to do the parity writes. Mm -hmm. So we have the same sort of speed as if we had one disk. Now you could actually use this sort of usefully if you made these guys all hard disk drives and you made this a fast SSD. And you'll occasionally see setups like this, probably not actually a RAID 4 setup, but this sort of strategy employed. But at the time when people were designing this idea, there weren't fast SSDs that you could buy. People would try to get like super high speed, uh, like extra fast spinning hard disk drives, like a 15K RPM hard disk drive to use for the parity drive, or try to do trickery with putting the parity drive as a RAM disk. And none of that was really great. So and RAID 4 is, is a good idea, but we want to improve it in order to be able to, to have what we want happen. And that is to get our redundancy without losing the performance benefit of striping. So the way we do that is we move from RAID 4 to RAID 5. So in RAID 5, RAID 5 is, the, the trick is, or the, the, the phrase is distributed parity. So we're going to have our four disks. We're not going to mark any of them specifically as a data disk or a parity disk. Instead, we're going to go ahead and write our data. So zero, um, I'm going to write stripes across this time, zero, one, two. And then because we've written all but one of our disks, we're going to go ahead and make this last thing be the parity. So this is going to be a parity of three because we're doing addition again. But um, we come down here and go four, sorry, this is three, four. We can't write our data here because that would mean that this last disk here would like sort of turn into the de facto parity disk. So instead, we're going to write our last block of data over to this last disk and put our parity here. So three plus four plus five, nine, 12, modulo 10 is two. And if we would go further, then the next parity block would be here, the next parity block would be here, and then we'd cycle back over again. And what this means is that because the parity is distributed, no one disk is going to be our bottleneck where we have to write parity for every write. We do still have to do two writes, like sort of minimum for every write, because we have to write both data and parity. And so we don't get quite as good a speed up as we would have gotten with striping. But the resulting performance here is four disks give us a read speed up of three times, because we can distribute the reads across all the data blocks in a row. And then four disks give us a write of two times because we're writing data across all the disks, but we have to do extra writes for parity, which ends up cutting our potential write speed up in half compared to, to where it would be otherwise. So that's RAID 5, and this is one of the more common uh, RAID setups for sort of larger arrays of disks. If you're talking about like two disks, you're gonna do zero or one. If you're talking about four disks, it's pretty common to do 10. If you're talking about 10 disks, you're starting to look at RAID 5 being the sort of only reasonable thing to do, because that, that way you get nine data disks or nine disks worth of space for data and are only wasting one disk worth of space for parity. Now there's one big remaining problem here with RAID 5, and that is that hard disks have gotten pretty big. And that means that we can have hard disk failures that we don't immediately notice. So you could write uh, 10 terabytes of data to a hard drive and just have one little thing go wrong on that hard drive, but you're not going to notice it till you read back that disk block. If this is in a big RAID 5 array, say there's a 
20 disk RAID 5 array with 19 disks worth of data space and one disk worth of parity, and you have a disk fail. But before you had that disk fail, you had a block fail in some other disk and just didn't notice. So you're going to pull out the disk that you know failed, you're going to put in a new disk, and that's going to trigger a rebuild on the array. And that requires reading every single block from every single disk to do the, the parity-based reconstruction. What's going to happen is if there's any block failures anywhere in the entire array, it will become apparent that there was a failure and you can't recover because RAID 5 can only recover from one failure. So a disk fails and your array is destroyed and you lose all your data during the rebuild. That's a common outcome with RAID 5 because the rebuild checks all your blocks and also it's stressing your disks. So that's a good time to have a failure. So the solution to that is RAID 6, which is double distributed par parity. And I'm just gonna illustrate this by adding another disk here. So we're gonna have our parity there and I guess we're going to put our four block here and we'll have our second parity block in that row here. And so the idea is that in every row, in every uh, stripe, we're going to have two parity blocks and we're going to use super clever math. Uh, go talk to the checksum information theory people and figure out how to make it so that we can lose any two disks and still rebuild. And that's possible. No, I don't know offhand what the, uh, what the formula is that makes that possible. You can't do something simple like addition or XOR, but you can do it. And so RAID 6 means you can lose two disks. You're spending two disks worth of space on parity. And if you're talking about an array of 10, of 10 terabyte hard drives where you have 40 disks in the array, you should definitely be doing this and not um, not RAID 5. In fact, you should be asking the question of whether there's sort of triple parity RAID 6. And so those are the sort of common RAID levels that we deal with nowadays. And this doesn't quite seem relevant yet, but it will be relevant. We'll get back to um, RAID mattering later in our file system story. So good luck with the current homework, and we'll be getting to more file systems next lecture.